this. It's looking good. Zoom. Okay. And record. All right. You are watching another Sun Solar panel. Uh, we are doing the old school delivery method of doing this recording. I have no idea how to make this thing look pretty like Greg does or Tim does. Uh, so you guys are just going to get the old school stuff. I'm up in the upper right corner. I'm Dave. And in the uh, middle right there, you got Matt Moore from Hardwood Paroxysm. Tell us where we can find you, Matt. Uh, you can find my work at the Action Network. Go to actionnetwork.com and download our app. It's uh, the best way to track sports. Awesome. All right. And uh, thank you for coming on. I followed Matt for a heck of a long time on Twitter. Uh, great analysis through through the different websites. I think you worked with CBS Sports in the past. Is that right? Yeah, I worked for CBS for seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's yeah, really, really good basketball analysis. Been following the NBA for a very long time. And this summer, you've gone through a few um, deep dives into different uh, NBA players, young NBA players. And, and can you go through – Devin Booker is one of them, obviously, with the Phoenix Suns. Can you go through the ones that you've gone through this, this kind of deep dive with? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm just basically doing normal stuff of just catching up on – you know, what guys really looked like, you just sitting up and watching all their possessions as many as I can and looking at their data as much as I can to try and get a sense for who they were last year. I did uh, Trey Young, Donovan Mitchell, uh, Devin Booker. I did Jason Tatum. I did Luka Doncic. Uh, I worked on, like, you catch various, like, I'm up on John Collins because I watch so much Trey Young stuff. Um, same thing with, like, Jalen Brown. Um I what else did I do? I did Buddy Heald as well as uh, as the Aaron Fox. Uh, I did those two guys, and I think I'm caught up on everybody. I meant to do uh, DeAndre Ayton today, but could not get around to it uh, due to constraints. But I'm doing DeAndre Ayton this week as well. Oh, excellent! Good. I'm looking forward to seeing what you get out of him for sure. Um, okay, so you've gone through several of these guys, and what you what you end up doing is you 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 said you end up watching all of their plays for the season. Is that right? Yeah, so I've got the ability with um, access to various tools to basically load up all their possessions, and I will just go through and be like, I will sort them by a random category uh, and just flip through and catch as many as I can. And I'll focus on transition, and then I'll do pick and roll, and then I'll do catch and shoot and just go through those as it goes um, to try and pick up on patterns. I'm I'm looking for you know things like, what's the placement on their passes to the corner? Uh, how often do they hit a guy in the pocket versus does a guy have to adjust? Um, what's their left look like versus their right? Um, you know, what are like the tendencies that they have? What's their kind of go-to signature moves and the things like that. You pick up on a lot of that stuff and it helps you get a sense for the team too. When you see, when you're watching these plays for one guy and you're able to get a sense for how the entire offense kind of rotates around them, I think it helps you get a sense for both that team and also how teams defended them, what worked and what didn't and where they struggled and, and what was effective. You get a pretty good sense from just like inundating yourself with as much as many clips as possible versus a game environment where it's like a game's always going to kind of have a narrative structure where it's like he did this because of that or they were down 15. So he may I want to see over and over and over again just the possessions of a guy and getting a sense for what they do, what they do well and what they don't do as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, good. And I know you've been on a couple of the other Suns podcasts over the past week or so. And so I don't want it, this to be a complete recap of those. So I, I really want to get into some things that I, I wished they would have talked to you about. Now, um, one or two of them you did before you did the deep dive on Booker and then uh, earlier this week, you did one um, after that deep dive. So let's see if we can go into into areas that you didn't already cover. Because um, my the typical Suns fan, I think, listens to all these pods because we all do it in a different way. Um, let's talk about what came out in the last couple of days with the with the old uh, Bill Simmons man. Um, first of all, is it Devin Booker's fault the Team USA almost lost to Turkey this week? Wow. Uh, no, it is not Devin Booker's <laughs> fault that, that they almost lost to Turkey this week. Uh, he is not solely responsible. The fate of the free world does not rest on Devin Booker's shoulders. Um, I tend to agree with Simmons on this point. Uh, I tend to, to lean, like, I don't think his point was incorrect. Um, he talked about, yeah, let's go into that a little bit. So 
Yeah, let's go into that a little bit. And 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 let's be serious. I was just joking about is it is it his fault? But um, really, how much should um, how hard how how much should Devin Booker have worked to play on Team USA this summer? I mean, I just think that he would have made it had he been available. He was a good enough player that he would have like obviously given what's on the roster now he would have gotten a spot and um, well he was he was offered a couple of months sure i mean well before he was offered before the other guys started dropping out too at least to go to yeah. training camp and be in the top 30 you know yeah and so like he would have made it um so like that's the risk right is like it would it would have been bad for him to go and then get cut that's bad um, but I think he would have made it given what their talent level is. Um, and part of that, though, I think is uh, when you talk to guys that have been, uh, there's this nebulous kind of idea of how good it is for their careers. And I really asked, I was like, what is it that, that makes a difference? And a lot of guys have said this. Um, you see how the greatest players in the league work. And it fundamentally shifts you because you realize the gap between what you do and what they do. And that you think it's talent, you think it's skill, and then you see them every day in a team environment and you start to recognize how hard they work and that drives you to be better. Like you have to be on their level because you're a teammate now. Like it's no longer like I can slack because I'm so much better than all these other dudes. Can't do that anymore. Because you, if you don't, if you do that, you're not going to play, and also you're going to lose the respect of the best players in the league, and that is a very big driving thing. Um, friendships are formed, I think that that spur good and bad things for I think fans, um, but I think it's a transformative experience. I think it lets them recognize how good the rest of of the league is because part of it is if you like, t- let's look at Booker, okay. He's able to look at all these losses and he's able to say, like, look, sh- could I have played better? Sure, I could have played better. But look at our team. Like, we lost all these games. It's not on. Like, before we get to me, we got to talk about all this other stuff first. Versus on Team USA, if you're not good enough, like, you're going to know where you have to get better. And it's going to drive you to get there because it's going to bug you because of your competitive spirit, which all NBA guys have because you have to in order to survive. So, all of those things I think would have been good for him. Um, but I, I think that, so like, that's the, that's really what Simmons was kind of saying. And I agree with him. Like he would have gotten out of it. He would have come out of team USA, a better player than he will come out of taking the summer and resting. Uh, yeah, he, he definitely, I totally see the point. I watched the, uh, Bill Simmons talking to Steve Nash about this, um, just the other day on the ringer podcast. And, uh, Steve Nash fully agrees as well that any young player should, play in, in in these world uh competitions like this uh nash said it springboarded his own career in 2000 and he became a near all-star the year after he played um but they did also talk about that there is a couple of differences now than 20 years ago or even 10 years ago or five years ago uh one of the differences is that the olympics to u.s folks to Americans. The Olympics means so much more than the World Cup. The World Cup is almost like a qualifier or a warm-up to us. Whereas around the world, that's seen as sometimes more important than the Olympics. I, I, I remember reading about this the, the uh, last year and, and they kind of alluded to it on on the the Ringer podcast. What do you think of that? I mean it's it's true, right? Like FIBA doesn't hold the same level of prestige, but um, I would just say, like, Devin Booker is not good enough to be making that distinction. Like, he is not <laughs> good enough to be like, no, no, I don't want that gold medal. I want a better gold medal. Only the best gold medals for Devin Booker. <laughs> Dude, you are you are a guy who scored 70, and everyone kind of chuckled at the way that you got it. Like, you are a guy that constantly puts up huge numbers in March, and we all go, you lost. Where's this been? Yeah. What like why am I supposed to care? Like you're not good enough to do that. And so like oh, the other thing is Team USA is a program. Like it's a program. And getting in and being part of that program is only going to set you up because in the future, if you're in a competition with a bunch of guys who are also all-star caliber like wing players, 
having been there will help you. Like that will help you if, if like, let's say Harden's like, no, man, like I've done it three times. I'm out. Like I'm not going next year. I'm not going to the Olympics next time. Or, you know, whoever else is going to be Bradley Beal. If he's like, look, man, like I'm coming up on free agency. I really can't, I can't do this this year. Um, that opens the door, but then you're going to be in competition with other dudes. And those other dudes may be guys that were like, no, I want to play for Team USA. I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this program. And it's going to be really hard for those coaches to just ignore everything for talent. They have a lot of talented guys. And Devin's maybe more talented than most, but he's not at the level of like a guy where he could just be like, no, I'm not going to play, and you have to have me next time. He's not that good. And so right. I think he's missing out on an opportunity to build those relationships as well. That's true. He was on, I mean, he has been around the program for a couple of years now, but I get what you're totally get what you're saying. He didn't solidify a spot this right. summer uh, to where the other guys have to beat him out rather than, and now he's just coming in with the other guys who also dropped out this year. Right. So, uh, okay. So it, it was a decision he made months ago. He was coming off a really um, injury frustrating season. He played a lot of games, uh, but he, played in a lot of, uh, you know, frustrating situations with his hand right. and with his yeah. ankles and all that stuff and his groin. And so I can see why right after the season, he said, no, nah, I'm going to take the summer off, especially if the guys are going around talking about how World Cup's not the same as the Olympics. But now he's, he, I wouldn't be surprised if he's regretting it a little bit, I, you know, looking, looking at it now. Um, yeah. You, I mean, it, you know, the injury stuff I think is valid in terms of if he's, if he really is, uh, you know what? Let's that was four, five months. You know, and they started back last time. So four months. If he spent four months and was still banged up and really didn't feel like his body was right, I get it. It's just one of those things where it's like that seems unlikely that uh, he was his body was such a mess that four months later he wasn't. Maybe it was, and that's that's an answer for. Well, I think so, he just didn't want to start off a season bad again. Like, and, and that's, and, and that's and fair. I, I'm partially putting words in his mouth. I did have a oh, conversation with him for a couple of minutes in the middle of the summer at one of his summer camps. Um, and he didn't want to start off the year bad again like last year. Last year, he could, I mean, he had a broken hand right. when he was trying to play. So he played through it, and that well, was tough until he pulled a groin. Yeah. And, you know, like, I mean, I, I'm one of the reasons that I'm going to be taking the Denver Nuggets under win total for the year is because I know Nikola Jokic just played the longest season of his career. He took two months off. And now he's playing for Serbia and he goes straight into training camp. So it's like uh, I'm expecting struggles from Jokic in terms of injury and fatigue this season more than ever because of that kind of a schedule. Um, so I like I get that like that can be tough. It's just that I think Booker's young enough like this is the time to do it. You're not going to be less tired when you're 26, 28. <laughs> yeah. like, that's not how that works. And so I think it, it would have been yeah. better for him to have maybe been like, okay, I get wanting to take advantage of the season. I, I do. But I think that this was also an opportunity for his long-term career that yeah. was worth the risk. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think we're both in, in agreement. I can see why he made the decision when he did, but I can also see why Booker might be looking back on it saying, ah, hey, man, I probably missed out on an opportunity. Let's go on to something else. So, um, well, you talked, you, you did a lot of deep dive onto Devin Booker and you talked on uh, the other podcasts about how uh, he's, he's better, obviously better with his right hand than his left hand passing, and, but he's pretty good in pick and rolls uh, primarily because he can pull up at any point, uh, but he's not really good at feeding to the rim and he's not really good at the weak side passes um, across court from his left. I get all that. But do you see, in with the progression that you saw there, assuming he gets even better on the on the ball handling in the future, is that really a position he should be playing? Should he be a lead playmaker in the later into his career, or should he really be given the opportunity to be the shooting guard he was always meant to be, who can pass? So, it I, here's the thing, okay. Um, Clay Thompson's on dribble game it used to be a lot better and it's kind of faded because he hasn't done it hardly at all in NBA situations. Um, can Booker be a worse defensively Clay Thompson? Yes. And like Clay Thompson's going to be a Hall of Famer. Like he's just going to be. Like he has absolutely the resume. So like that's a pretty high bar. Now, Clay's a phenomenal defender, which Devin will never be. And that's okay. Um, but he can be that kind of a weapon, but he's going to need something around him where a system that allows him to get the kind of looks that, that 
Clay gets consistently all the time in order to reach that kind of level. And then the other thing is, if Devin's your best player, which he is, he needs the ball in his hands to create, and he can get to all these shots. He can create his own look. Like, Devin's on-dribble game is better than Clay's because of where Clay's career went. Um, but part of that means that, and, and here's kind of the key is, if he's going to have the ball and he's going to be able to create his own shot, which is really valuable, guys, NBA guys stress this. It's why they love all those guys that analytics don't like. And then a lot of fans are like, he's not really like they love DeMar DeRozan because DeMar can go get his a bucket. Like he can go score on his own versus NBA talent. And a lot of guys that are like analytical darlings can't do that. Um, Devin can go score on his own but they're going to send two at him. And the good news is, is his willingness to pass. So it's like, he needs to improve these things because if he's a guy that if you send two on, he's going to make you pay for it. Then he's a guy that can take a high volume of shots. that can be a lead initiator, can be tip of the spear, but can also punish guys if they overhelp on him. And that makes your team better. Like that's the gateway to Devin Booker going from great stats to high impact is his ability to punish the defense for how they approach him and his willingness to pass, I think is a really key point. And it's a, it's a really promising thing. Like I want to encourage that if I'm the Suns, like I want to build on that. I want his left-handed pass to get better because if he's able to reverse court, it's chaos and he's going to find a lot of relocation threes off of that. It's only going to help him. Um, so that's kind of the thing is, um, he needs a role. I'm with you 100% on that. Like, he needs a role that is not like, hey, Devin, go do some stuff with a bunch of guys that don't know where they're supposed to be. Um, but he's going to have guys that know where they're supposed to be next year. And he needs to be able, I think, uh, to make those passes in order to get the most out of his team. And that's going to make the Suns better. So he can get the stats and the impact and the wins. And that's going to give him the profile that Suns fans think he deserves. So uh, you, when you did your deep dive on the Suns last season, I saw a couple of tweets on, oh, my God, this is just the worst thing ever. That, uh, it, and you, you answered a couple of questions on the other pods about whether that was uh, as much Devin as it is anybody else. But I want to take a different tact on that. Do you think that it's coaching that players can't be in the right position and make the right reads and make the right rotations or do you think it's the players that can't that aren't paying attention to the coaches no it's knowledge base so the coaches will tell you they went over it and over it and over it that they told this guy you got to be in this corner you gotta be ready for that pass or that they assume that guys coming in will know these things and they don't have time like think of it you have no practice time you used to have very little practice time during the season with the way that they've changed the schedule you have none you have no practice time. So if you're adding Spalding, like you won't have time to be like, hey, you need to make sure that you're aware that if he goes to the baseline, you have to slide down because he can't kick it white all the way back up to you if they close off that baseline. you got to be ready to catch deep in the corner. We saw so many possessions, so many, where it was just like, why are you standing there? Like, why would you be there? And it's just <laughs> like knowledge base, right? And and the reality of that is like, it's easy for me to say that because I'm not actively playing it and I'm not there and I'm not an NBA guy and dealing with the wear and tear and the bank, all of that. But the other thing is the reason I'm able to identify it is because I watch all 30 teams. So I know what it's supposed to look like because I see it night after night after night. And knowledge base is such a huge part of it. It's just competent NBA players that have a lot of reps and a lot of minutes because they've been in the league and they have the skill and work ethic to be there are going to understand the little things like I know that when he lobs that pass on a ball reversal, I know I've got to be ready to move down because that's usually where that pass goes. It's oh, on this action, I got to make sure I'm out of the way because otherwise I'm bringing another defender to the action when they're already crashing it, it defeats the entire purpose of spreading <laughs> the floor. Like there are these little things that get lost and it's even simple stuff. Like I can't make that pass. They'll grab it. Cause it's happened to me. Like those guys have all ha mis made those mistakes. <laughs> like they've made those. That's the biggest thing is like a lot of these guys that are screwing up don't know. Cause they're just like, I haven't been in here. I didn't know that I used to, I could do this in college. And it's like, you can't do that here, kid. Like, that is not how that works here. You can't make that pass. And so, like, a lot of those dynamics, that's how it wound up. And just, like, um, even stuff like how guys set screens, the angles that they take on those screens, the positioning that they have, what the role looks like, where you're at. Like, are you looking for Booker 
Um, Booker's biggest thing is like he telegraphs. He tell like he he watches the guy that he's passing to the whole right. way, like a quarterback <laughs> staring down a receiver, and there's a safety and a corner that are both like. Are you saying he's like Nathan Peterman? Come on, man. <laughs> a little bit. So like that's a problem, right? Is like is like unless Devin is is purposely doing like the no look, which is like you're looking right at him. And then as you're passing, you look away. So it looks like you're no looking <laughs> like that stuff struggles. Um, and that's stuff that you have to learn, right. Is like, don't look down, don't look, don't look down your receiver, those kind of right. things, but it's also positioning to make it easier. So there's all these little off, things. Big guys. Yeah, exactly. There's all these little things that, and you can say like, isn't the coach supposed to clean that up? But when like, you, you right. don't have the ability to like in college, you take a week and you're like, we're doing nothing but spacing drills. That's all we're doing today is you guys are going to learn how to space the floor or you're going to take the bigs and you're like, we're setting screens all day. You slip one time and we're running la like you can't do that in the NBA. It's not how it works. So you just move on to the next game and there's no scouting. And you like, so the biggest problem for the Suns, honestly, has been how far behind they are in knowledge base. And that's why I've consistently said that they're going to win over 30 games because their knowledge base is a lot broader with the guys that they brought yeah, you in. Could, you could just it – was, it was so palpable just watching Tyler Johnson play a little basketball for this team, the difference. And, and he didn't know the plays. He nope. hadn't been in the system. Nope. But you could just see – that yeah. he was so different than every other player on the court, and he made the Suns better just by existing. His and his his stats were terrible. He shot like thirty some percent from the floor. He he didn't commit turnovers. That was the biggest key. He had like a four to one turnover ratio to 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 assists, and he didn't have many assists. He only averaged like four a game, and he was playing the point guard position and shooting terribly. But he was like thousand miles better than anyone else who had played that position that year. Yeah, and it's just like. Because because Johnson came up with the Heat and he has experience, but also the Heat have like this like they have a recurring model yeah, where same coach every year. Yeah, well, and, and not just that they've got Wade and Haslam that set a tone, and those guys said if you know when you come in, you're going to do things this way, and those guys they would help them. And the Suns, it was like they would bring in a guy for veteran leadership, but he was on a one year deal and he was probably yeah. going to be gone. Like. It's this revolving and door. The tail end of his career, his athleticism yeah. is gone, and it's, and it's not the same when, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you there's a reason that the Heat have brought back Udonis Haslam for a million years is because of of what he brings in terms of setting a tone for the work ethic that they want, and all those things kind of play a part. Um, so I think that you like you have to have success in order to to translate that success to the guys coming in. Um, so yeah, like having guys like Tyler Johnson, having guys like Ricky Rubio. Dario Saric, honestly, is going to bring a lot to the table. Aaron Baines is going to bring a lot. Like, they're all going to know what the hell they're doing. Um, and that's one of the big keys is, like, uh, they're not low on talent. Like, these guys are really talented. They're not the Bobcats, where the Bobcats, you would watch them, and it wasn't that they didn't know what they were doing. is that they couldn't physically do anything. They just didn't have any of the skills. They couldn't shoot. They couldn't pass. They couldn't dribble. They couldn't drive. Like, they just couldn't do anything. You know, this team is just they don't know what they were doing. And, and you've seen that a lot. Um, there's certainly, I think, a level to which coaching has suffered from whatever the overall culture has been there, sure, where yeah. I think that uh, I think that there's like a, a synergistic relationship. The coaching wasn't penetrating the bad culture. And that's on the coaching. But the bad culture was infecting the coaching and making them not listen and that causes like a reciprocal relationship. And I think that bringing in a new coach and a veteran roster, that this is like a hard reset. That's one of the reasons, again, I'm so big on this team is right. everyone's like, oh, it's the Suns. And I'm like, it's not. It's really yeah. not. Like it's this Booker is, and Aiton. Yeah. And then it's like a lot of new – and Bridges, and it's a lot of new dudes other than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Monty Williams even bringing in longtime veteran assistant coaches as well. Um, Willie Green is fairly new to the game as far as um, I think he's only been an assistant for a couple of years. But um, you've got a couple of guys from the Thunder um, uh, coaching staff that have, had been on in, with the Thunder for 10 years. And and I, I just think and Steve Blake was a player development guy up in Portland. But Steve Blake, man, if, 
if rookie Ty Jerome emulates Steve Blake in his career and then is just a better version of that, I mean, that would be pretty good. And Steve Blake was always a guy who killed the sun. So that's why I'm high on him. <laughs> and, and again, you're talking about guys that were professionals, right? Like yeah. both, both Willie Green and Steve Blake are dudes that were liked by coaches because they were pros. And that matters. Like just conducting yourself in the right way enough. to And like, hopefully, I think with Monty, they'll be able to do this is like, being able to tell players, cut the sh- like, hey, turn off the music. We're working now. Like yeah. that stuff matters, you know, because like you want young guys to be able to be young and make mistakes, but they also have to learn. Like this is a serious business, and if you do not perform, everybody gets fired. So, absolutely, um, yeah. So with Monty Williams running the team this year, you've got the like you've. Uh, You've pointed out the Suns have a much better overall roster. Like for the first time in five years, the Suns are not counting on any rookies. Yeah. They have a couple of rookies, but they don't need those rookies unless right. some major injuries happen. But that's a, what that's a rookie's job is to just step in when there's major injuries. I mean, there's a chance that Cam Johnson suddenly comes out hitting 40%, but the Suns don't need it. You know, right. from three, you know, the Suns don't need it. Ty Jerome could be the next, you know, Steve Blake type or under, you know, just the white guy who runs point guard and does it better than anyone thought he could, you know, kind of guy. And But they don't need that. They, they, they can let these guys grow, and I'm really looking forward to it. As far as Ricky Rubio as a point guard next to Devin Booker for 30 minutes a night, um, do you think those guys should always share the floor? Do you think they should stagger? Um, they're, so they're, one of them's always out there. I mean, what, what do you think on that? Um, I think I, th- here's the, thing, this is the nice part is I think you can probably run enough lineups where, uh, you can run Rubio and Booker, uh, and then you can run Rubio, Booker and Johnson, and then you can run Johnson and Booker, uh, and you can run Rubio and Johnson. And I think it'll be good to get some stretches where, you don't run with Booker. And the reason I say that is not because of, of Booker being bad or a drag, but everybody's going to eat then, right? Like everybody's going to get a little bit of a dis- distribution, which means that in the minutes that Booker does play, you can get the best of Booker and you can be like, we're going to optimize Devin. Like that's our entire thing is we want to get our star high quality looks with a decent amount of feeding Aiden as well. Um, and if you balance that, like I'm, I'm very big on, you need to optimize your best player. And I think that's going to open up, I think, uh, uh, some opportunities for him. I think that honestly, like when I started thinking about what they were going to bring to the table, like if, if they run out a Rubio, Tyler Johnson, Kelly Oubre, Aaron Baines, um, DeAndre Ayton lineup, like I think that lineup can have a positive net rating. It may only be like a 1.1. But they're just going to be like decent versus backups to be able, like if they're playing, um, if they're playing the Pistons, and that that's like a second, uh, an early second quarter unit that they get in before they put Booker in back at like the six minute mark. I think that lineup can can do some damage, um, and be able to be because they won't they make big mistakes, right? They, they won't just, be incredibly scoring, you know, scoring output, but they they also won't make even Aiton. When you get into your deep dive on Aiden, I'm really curious to see what your take is going to be. He didn't make huge mistakes from what I could tell. He just didn't always know where to be, and he didn't right. make his third and fourth and fifth rotation on a possession right. within three seconds. Um, and he was a little timid on going for blocks because he didn't want to commit fouls and get in foul trouble because he was the was second leading scorer kind of on the team until Kelly Oubre came around. Um, so he's naturally a more conservative guy on, on going for the shot blocks, but – I'm I'm curious what your take is going to be on whether he he is a guy who doesn't you know make all the right decisions. I, I think he does make mostly the right decisions. It's just he's he's less aggressive than you might hope he would be in making those, and I think that'll grow in his second, third, and fourth year, big time. Um, so I'm, I'm curious when when you get to that point, what your takeaway is going to be. Yeah, I think um, part of it too is I want I want to see Booker play with Baines a lot because someone will actually screen for him for the first time in his NBA career (laughs) and lay people out (laughs) and lay people out, um, which is a really big deal is creating. You you mentioned also the other day that um, the key is Booker using the screen, right? Yeah. So he has to trust it and rub off of it. Like Damian Lillard is one of the best at at rubbing around us, rubbing around the screen in the three point line and then curling right into a three 
totally uncontested. And, and CJ McCollum's pretty good at it too. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen Booker do that. Well, and the other thing is, uh, the good thing about Baines is Baines after the play will like be like, no, like you have to come around. Like, you can't, <laughs> yeah, right. no. He'll tell him he'll fix it. Yeah. He'll be like, you can't, no, you can't be like going looping around me like that. I can't screen him there. Like you have to come right. short. Cause you um, can't move once you're set. Right. You, you know, if, yeah. if Booker goes too wide, then he can't help. Exactly. So like there's, there's stuff like that. I think they'll help and, and he'll, he'll listen and he'll get a sense for what Booker wants. And like, I think that that connection will be pretty good. And if you give Booker separation, he's going to get to that two dribble jumper every single time. And he's money from literally anywhere on the floor. Um, and that's only going to make them better. So like, I just think that there's a lot that can help there. There's just, they're going to have so many options for staggering, right? Like you can be, you know, if it turns out that Tyler Johnson and Dario Saric play really well together, okay, we're going to pull Saric out early and we'll put him back in when we bring Johnson onto the floor, depending on, on where Johnson plays. If it's, um, oh, Booker plays really well with Kelly Oubre or it's Mikhail Bridges, like that's the combo that really works. Like they have options for how to mix and match guys. Like Johnson makes a lot of this work and I think Oubre helps too. Like in having those wings and Saric too, like they have fluidity. So they can basically right. say like, what do we want to do here? What do we need to do given injuries or matchups or, you know, who's feeling it or whatever. And we can adjust to that as the game goes along. And I think that that's going to be really big um, for helping Booker and for helping the rest of that team go is they're going to be able to say, you know, if it, if it turns out that, you know, Ubre and Booker just don't fit together. Okay. That's fine. Like Ubre comes off the bench. You're going to play Saric and you're going to play whoever else. Um, and you're going to go bridges. We haven't even talked about him. Yeah. Yet. You're going to play, you play bridges, right? Uh, you play them and then off the bench, you're bringing in Tyler Johnson and Kelly Oubre. And then you know, you've got this competent unit um, right off the bat in terms of wings with athleticism. Like there's just like a lot of options for the Suns, And I think that that's one thing that's going to make thing, uh, things should be easier on Booker and also allow him to do more in, in a more narrow scope. And that's going to be the key. I think the hardest thing for him is going to have to like be willing to let go of those reins and trust in the fact that, that this is this is I think Monty Williams' biggest challenge is he's going to have to be like you can let go, the ball is going to get back to you, like the yeah. ball is going to get back to you, and he has to have faith in that. And if he and if not he, in a complete bailout, bailout. Where you have to go right. to mid court to catch a lame pass with ten seconds left on the shot clock. Right, and I think that you have enough guys that that's one of the things that's nice is like they didn't they didn't go out and get gunners like they didn't go out and pull yeah. in like they didn't go out and get Marcus Morris again or somebody like Marcus Morris. Right. Like they didn't get guys, take yeah. all the fun out of everything. <laughs> right. So it, they didn't get guys that are like, it's my time now. They got guys that like even Kelly Oubre, like one of, one of my favorite anecdotes about Kelly Oubre, um, his trainer is Drew Hanlon that works with Jason Tatum. Um, and Hanlon's famous for like, he works on guys jumper because he knows that if they, if, if they're able to score on their own, they get paid. And that's like a big part of what he does. But Hanlon said one time at a talk that he gave at a, at a conference, he said, Kelly Oubre is the only player that ever came to me and said, came to me in the summer. And I said, what do you want to work on? And he said, I want to work on defense. He's the <laughs> only player that ever said that. So like, I am always kind of going to be in Kelly Oubre's corner because I appreciate anybody that like goes into their summer and is like, I want to get better defensively. He is such a surprise, Kelly Oubre. Of course, I never watched him much being in, in Washington, you know, um, but he comes off as so cool and, 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 you know, chill when he's off the court, he's just like, Hey man, you know, he's like, he's just like totally chill. And then when he gets on the court in the game, he's a demon. Like he is constantly moving constantly. He's, he doesn't always make the right decisions, no. but he it's never for lack of effort. It's never for lack of trying. Well, I noticed when I was doing the, the breakdown that a lot of what would happen is Booker would pass it and the guys would hesitate. Whoever he was passing to like Josh Jackson did this a lot where it's like, oh, should, I, should I, should I, should I shoot or should I, should I pass? Should I, what should, and then like Kelly Oubre is like, no, I'm like, I've got to look, I'm shooting. Or if it was a, if it was an extra pass, it was like, I'm immediately moving it just because like Oubre has been in playoff series. Oubre has had to earn minutes on a playoff team. And so like, he knows like, you better know what you're doing when that ball arrives. Um, and you better not be always shooting, but you need to have a lot of confidence and, um, he had a, a, he had 35% off passes from Booker last year, which matched up with what I saw, which was like, that's a pretty good connection. I have a, like, um, if they run out a lineup of Rubio bridges, Booker 
Ubre and a big, which is super small. Like that's a tiny lineup, but you have so much shooting all the time that that's going to be really, really hard to stop. And like, that's the kind of lineup that they need to run because they're not going to be good defensively because they still are young and they're undersized and they have all these issues, but they're going to be able to put up some points. And in the Western conference, you got to put up points. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll circle back to, around to Booker. What do you think uh, would be the ideal season for Devin Booker to have? Like, you know, maybe you can go by stats or just by feel or, or what, what do you think would be the ideal season for him to become that player you know that he could be do you have off the top of your head what he averaged last year yeah he was like uh 27 points uh 6.8 assists all right uh i would say that the ideal season for him is probably right around where he was last year maybe like 27 28 um i'll say 28 uh fewer assists but a really high percentage conversion rate on those assists a lower turnover figure and then a really strong plus minus. Like it needs to be like when Devin Booker's on the floor, they're outscoring teams by six points. Um, and, you know, and even, maybe a 38, 40% back to that on his uh, threes. Right. So He's, threes last year because yeah. they were all pull ups. Right. And he won't have to have so many pull ups. Right. Year. The other thing I think is key is he's got to be able to work in a few mechanisms that he can really go to that aren't just. I'm going to dribble off a pick and hope or I'm going to dribble into traffic and hit like a short jumper. Like that's a really great skill that he's got. And it's really valuable. Like it's my favorite move of his is when he puts that guy on his, on his back, mm -hmm. when he puts him in jail and then hits that short jumper. Like that's beautiful. His, his control on those is awesome, but I want to see him do more stuff like, Oh, I'm going to figure out like, because of Sarich, we're going to run Sarich Booker handoffs and, if they blitz Booker, Sarich is open for three. And if they try and switch it, Booker's going to have a, have a slower defender on him, can back up and hit a three. Like those little mechanics to get to tried and true things. So he's not always having to ad lib crazy shit every single possession. Every I single possession he right. had to start from scratch. Right, would be huge. And a lot of time, like you can tell, he's just like improvising. Try, like he's just right. trying to. He's just like, I guess I'll go, okay, I'm going to go over here and I'll get to it. Like go to things where it's like, we're going to do this and this is going to happen. And we're going to either going to go here or there. Boom. And that consistency, I think is going to bring it up to snuff. Like um, he put up numbers and he's going to continue to put up numbers. The efficiency is obviously key, but that efficiency is going to come with him having mechanics that he can trust and that they trust him with. And I think if he gets to those two things, he's going to have an impactful season, and that's way better than having a big stat season. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate you doing this podcast, and I'll let you know when it gets up there, and, and hopefully you'll share it with your followers. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, bud. Let's see here. i got to kill this. All right. I appreciate you.